Well, good morning. Everybody decided to sit on this side today. It's like empty over here, man. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Hey, I am so glad you're here. If you are new and don't know me, my name's Justin, and I'm just one of the leaders here. I just want to welcome you. I'm glad you've chosen to worship with us today. I've been reflecting this morning on what's the purpose behind getting together to worship each week. Is it so that way we can feel better from singing certain songs or experience a certain emotion? Is it to just to hear a sermon or see people who we've missed throughout the week? I think that it's bigger than that. I don't think it's self-serving at all. I think we actually come together in order to do something, in order to glorify the one who created us. The Westminster Catechism says this, the first question asks, what is the purpose of man? To which it answers, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God 
and fully enjoy him forever. That is what we do when we gather on Sundays. We glorify the Lord and we enjoy his presence as his people. And so would you join me this morning in glorifying God with music and with our voices? Would you stand and sing? as we continue singing Amazing Grace.
Good morning. If we haven't met, my name is Patrick, and I started coming to Leverington in 2022. I was asked to lead us in the Apostles' Creed today, and I want to share something with you beforehand, if I may. My wife and I left our church of 10 years in the midst of its collapse at the end of 2020, and as we approached Easter of 2021, it would be the first Easter that we would not join our church on Lemon Hill for a sunrise service. Though we were saddened by this, we decided to sojourn to another hillside in Philadelphia to greet the rising sun alone. We should not have been, but we were surprised to see dozens of other Christians in small mobs on the hillside, some shouting and singing, some playing trumpets, all rejoicing in the risen Christ. That moment solidified my love of the liturgical traditions, that we as children of God share truth across time and space. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, we are joined to our brothers and sisters in Christ the world over. It is a reminder to us and our brothers and sisters across the globe that we are not alone, but bound to the body and truth. Through this lens, will you please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed together? I believe in God, the Almighty Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, the elementary children can be dismissed. Uh, to the leaders in the back. If you have not registered your children and need to do so for them to participate, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that in Westminster Hall. Um, and as they exit, would you join me in continuing to worship as we sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Good morning. Please join me as we come before the throne of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and honor you and glorify you in your holy name for all that you are and all that you have been and all that you will be forever. Lord, we're so grateful that you have revealed yourself to us and that you work through us, you allow us to be part of something that is so big and honorable. But Lord, sometimes it gets really hard and we don't always know how we can get through it, how we can be righteous in a world that doesn't want righteousness or how we can be strong in the face of rejection and lies. But Lord, in our weakness, you are strong and your strength comes through us. And we learn that we're not better than our master, but that if the world rejected you, it rejects us as well. And we count that cost, and we just fall on our knees and ask you, O oh God, to be with us, to fill us with strength, to fill us with peace, to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we overcome, in the end, all that the enemy has thrown against us. And Lord, we're so grateful that all we have to do to experience you and your full power is to come in humility, be ourselves, and confess our sins to you. And so, Lord, in our hearts, we now name those things that might have been unpleasing to you and to our own hearts. We thank you, Father, that you are faithful and just, but you also promise to forgive our sins and put them as far away as the east is from the west. We can be free every time we confess to you, and we're so grateful for that. Lord God, I lift up all those who are being persecuted for the righteousness around the world. I ask that you be with them now in power, strength, and grace, and peace. Comfort your church until we're in your arms safely home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey there, again. 
Hey, if you are new with us or you're just curious what's going on here and you're not sure how to get more info, I just want to highlight real quick before we get into some announcements that the best way to do that, and I know you hear this every week, but if you're new, you haven't, uh, is to get connected, scan the QR code on the screen, fill out a connect card in front of you. Those are both great ways to give us enough info to where we can send you an email every single Sunday that says, hey, here's what's going on, because there is a lot, especially as we're coming up on Easter, and I promise we will not be weird. We will not show up at your door. We will not spam you a whole bunch. We, we really do try to keep it to a minimum. So um, there's not a whole lot of risk to it. So we'd love to know you and know that you're here, and we'd love to share a little bit more about ourselves. So just want to lift that up. It's also a great place to uh, submit prayer requests too. So another thing that I want to highlight, and I believe it might have been in the email this week, is the Thursday 3. Yeah, it is. This is a devotion that Pastor Langdon does every single week. He sends it out on Thursdays. It's three minutes. It's really quick, and I highly recommend it. If you have not, we haven't lifted it up in a while, so if you have not signed up for it, or you've never known how to get it, or you've been on our website, and you're like, what is that? Uh, that's what it is. So uh, you can sign up by going to the website or scanning the QR code, and I just, it's a great way to stay for, to continue to be filled with the word of God throughout the week. So I highly recommend that as well. And then another thing that we haven't lifted up in a bit is prayer requests. Uh, I've mentioned before that one of the great ways to do prayer requests is through that connect card. But, and we do have a team that prays all week long. Um, Our staff and our prayer team prays for every single prayer request that comes in. And we're also looking for more people to join that team. So if you enjoy prayer, if you consider yourself someone who has a great prayer, or if you think you're someone who doesn't, but you want to grow in it, this is a great way to do that. Join our prayer team. Um, it's Sue Major is the one who leads that. She's fantastic. I cannot speak highly enough for her. And she's just wonderful. She's not here today. I'm sure she's watching online. So if that, hi, Sue. Um, but you can email the office at levpress.org. Or another way is... If you do a connect card or fill one out from the pew, just write on there in the comment spot, like, I'd like to join the prayer team or I'd like to learn more and we'll connect with you about it. And then something exciting that's been going on the entire month of February, and this week is technically the last week to be a part of it, is our care uh, kit collection that we're doing. And... I just wanted to share this. So when we first, when the outreach team, we have a team that comes up with outreach events and ways to serve, came forward with this idea of doing the care kit collection, they estimated that it would cost about $6,000 for us to put this together. And as of this morning, when I checked, our church, all of you, have given over $5,000 of supplies towards this. So can we celebrate that? Like, that is a huge thing. I'm not trying to be self-congratulatory in any way. Like that is an incredible thing. All of that is going out the doors of this church into our community, into communities around Philadelphia. Like that is the hands and feet of Jesus. And I think that's incredible. And it's not too late to be a part of it. Two ways you can be a part of it. One, it should be on the screen that you can text to give. It's a, you can give straight to this. Um, we're closing down the Amazon list just because we don't have a lot of time to gather and organize our supplies. So if you want to give, there's a spider right there. Um, <laughs> terrified of spiders. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. Couldn't let that go. My wife's laughing in the back because she knows how true it is. Uh, Hey, you can text to give. Something always happens. Uh, You can text to give um, straight to that. And there's, it's really easy to do, or you can give through the offering box in the back, or um, there's lots of ways to do that. But just want to encourage you. And then the second way to be a part of this is next Sunday, show up. Because next Sunday, not only have we been giving towards this, but we're actually going to shorten our service on Sunday, and we're going to put these kits together together as a community. And so it's a great way for us to worship through service together. And so I just want to encourage you, be here next Sunday if you can. Make it it a big deal for you to be here, because it's going to be a big deal. I'm really excited, and I can't wait to see what, what God does with this. And then finally... Um, We love to talk about how we want to be a place where people are known and where we value every single person. And one of the ways we do that is through celebrating birthdays and important milestones in people's lives. And so this week, uh, we get to celebrate Henry Howard, Ben Epstein, and Marsha Turner. We love you guys very much. We're so glad you're a part of our community here. And we pray that God will bless you richly in the year ahead. As you've probably uh, gathered from us talking about the care kit collection and other things we share here, we're, we're a church that really values generosity. 
um, not just financial, but through people who give up their time to pray every single day for the people of this church. People who serve with kids or in the band or in the tech team or greeting people. People who give really, you know, strange skills that you wouldn't think would be useful, like sanding doors and building construction projects. And I laugh because Eric's right there and he sanded doors for five out, for probably more than five hours. And because, and that's an incredible skill. People are so generous in this church. It's one thing that blows me away every single week. And our challenge every week is this, that during the time of our offertory as the band plays, that you would reflect on the great generosity that God has extended to each of us. And you would ask the question, how can you respond in turn this week? And so would you continue to worship with me as the band plays and we continue to sing and worship with the gift of music? We invite you to sit back and listen as we sing Firm Foundation. i 
I'm back. Justin got me on a twofer. Um, he asked me to read for us uh, the text he's going to speak about today, which is Matthew 10, 17 to 33. If you want to open to your Bible or if you want to borrow a pew Bible, it's on page 1511. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will be... Betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that you will, that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, man. My wife and I have recently gotten into a new show uh, that came out on Apple TV called Masters of the Air. Has anybody anybody heard of it or seen it? It's a World War II, it's kind of a warfare, or definitely a warfare movie. Um, I'm a sucker for history and World War II and a little bit of violence and airplanes, and that's what this is all about. So it's really, it's really got my attention, and my wife is kind enough to watch it with me. So uh, it follows a group of men who are uh, piloting B-17 bombers in World War II. And uh, they're part of the 8th Air Force in Nazi, or flying over Nazi Germany. And if you like cinematography, like that's a thing for you, it is a beautifully shot and produced uh, show. It is, I think it's Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg are the producers. And it insightfully captures some of the unique challenges faced by the men who engaged in aerial warfare early in the war. And the author of the history book that the series is based on, Donald Miller, this is how he describes the unique task of these men. Listen to this. Fighting at 25,000 feet in thin, freezing air that no warriors had ever encountered before, bomber crews battled new kinds of assaults on body and mind. Air combat was deadly but intermittent. Periods of inactivity and anxiety were followed by short bursts of fire and fear. The life of a, quote, bomber boy, as they were known, was one of a pendulum swing to where at any moment, the pendulum could go from a place of mundanity and routine, sitting on base or sitting in in the aircraft just listening to the engine's hum, to one of hypervigilance and intense fear. These, These bomber boys at one moment could be dancing to the latest swing music, and the next they would be evading hostile German aircraft within hours of each other. They, unlike the ground infantry, they got to sleep on clean sheets. They got to eat three square meals a day. But at the same time, they would have to endure temperatures of 40 degrees below zero for hours on end. 
They lived in relative safety while on base, but their job was one of the deadliest in World War II. In fact, more men died in the 8th Air Force alone than the entire Marine Corps in the course of the war. They could get passes to stroll the streets of London. They got to frequent local bars, get glimpses of what a normal life could look like, and yet at the same time, many watched countless numbers of friends die because they were under-equipped, they were outgunned, and they were sent out in broad daylight to face one of the greatest air defense networks ever. 60,000 anti-aircraft weapons, over 1 million men manning them. One quarter of all of Germany's fighter aircraft focused on protecting uh, the motherland or the fatherland. And as if facing this was not hard enough, there was the guilt that would come for those who had to stay behind on base or for those who survived when others did not. In one of the episodes of the show, one of the characters named Crosby, he's a navigator in one of the bomb crews. He's given a promotion. He's promoted to a desk job. And all of his friends go out on a mission, and all he can do is sit and wait. And he says this, he narrates a scene where he's sitting in an empty dining hall, eating a meal. He says, the hardest part of any mission is the anticipation, the waiting. No matter how well I plot the routes or how thoroughly I brief the navigators after wheels up, there is nothing I can do but wait for them to come home. And later in the episode, he finds out that not a single one of his friends survived. And in subsequent episodes, they follow him as he deals with the grief and the confusion over why he got to live while they did not. The show presents two very different challenges, and it asks a question of both. On one side, how do you show up to your job, your task, the work set in front of you, knowing the extreme challenges that lay ahead, the potential for pain, the possibility of death. The second question, what does it mean if the promised challenges, the things you had been working yourself up to face, don't come to pass or they simply pass you by? Throughout the history of the church, followers of Jesus have had to ask the same question. See, in Matthew 10, 17 to 33, Jesus warns of persecution that is going to come against his followers, some to the point of death. And the message was not just for his followers then, but as we're going to see, was also for the church to come. What are Jesus' apprentices to do in the face of intense trial and resistance when their security, their happiness, even their life are threatened for the sake of Christ? Or, what may be more challenging for some, what does it mean if this promised persecution doesn't occur or simply passes you by? In our passage for today, we learn four different sources of persecution that come against the gospel message and all who proclaim it. But we'll see at the same time how to persevere in the light of this resistance and ask the question, what does it mean if the persecution fails to arise against us? So with that, let's turn our attention to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, like all of the texts of Scripture, all the books of the Bible, has a particular literary structure that's very helpful for us to understand as we come to the text today. The Gospel is designed into seven parts, a beginning, an intro, and a conclusion, and then five uh, sections in the middle, each of them primarily stories about Jesus, and each of those sections ends with a teaching of some kind. So in Matthew so far, in chapter 4, Jesus has laid out his gospel, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In chapters 5, 6, and 7, he lays out his ethic for life in the kingdom. That's the Sermon on the Mount. And then in chapters 8 and 9, he begins to demonstrate what this kingdom of heaven actually looks like. The power behind God's grace in the kingdom through signs and wonders. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. He resurrects the dead. He forgives sins. He calms stormy seas. And Matthew 10 is the, that, the teaching section, the sort of capstone to everything that has been going on in chapters 8 and 9. And so as we turn our focus to chapter 10, we find the 12 who would become the apostles gathered with Jesus and we find Jesus giving his disciples the exact same power that he just demonstrated in chapters 8 and 9 and charging them to go to the lost sheep of Israel 
to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and demonstrate that the kingdom is here through signs and wonders, which when you think about it, all sounds good, right? Like who, who doesn't want the power to heal illnesses, to cast out demons? Like that would be, I don't know if it'd be helpful every day, but it would be helpful. Um, you, could, you would think that things are really great. Like this is really exciting stuff. All of Matthew to this point has been building to this. This is the kingdom of heaven. This is how you live within it. This is the power that shows the kingdom is here. Now you go demonstrate that power to others. And Jesus, what does he do? It doesn't necessarily end on this happy note. He, he foretells that some will accept the message of the gospel, but others will reject it. And so with that in mind, we pick up in Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. Would you follow along in your Bible? Be on guard against men and women. You're not off the hook, okay? They will hand you over to the local councils. They will flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, notice it's when, not if. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking in you. And then it gets a little worse. Brother will deliver brother to death. The father, his child, children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus begins with a warning. Be alert, be on guard, be wary as you go out. Why? Well, if you go to the very ver the verse right before this section, verse 16, we learn that Jesus is sending his disciples out on essentially a missionary journey to go spread the news of the gospel. Like sheep among wolves, Jesus says. The mission of sharing the gospel is a dangerous one, according to Jesus. And Jesus' disciples are told to be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. In other words, be Christ-like in their engagement with the world, being wise, but also blameless. And so in exercising wisdom, they are to be wary. They're to be on guard because persecution is going to come. And then Jesus tells us three sources of persecution that arise right here. First, he tells us that persecution will arise from religious groups. They will hand you over to the local councils. The local councils or the Sanhedrin were the local religious courts that had the power to punish those who had offenses against Jewish law and custom. We see this play out on a greater scale later in the gospel when Jesus is brought before the great Sanhedrin, the, the central council in Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Not only will he be brought before the religious courts, but they will flog you in their synagogues. Some translations read meeting houses. These are the Jewish equivalent of churches. They will whip you in church, which makes you wonder what church was like back in the day. It'd be like us saying, oh, we just sang Amazing Grace. And James, come on up here. You sin this week. We got to whip you. Like, I'm way off track there. Let's keep going. Thanks for chuckling. So Jesus foretells that as the gospel message goes out, the disciples will be brought before the religious authorities and they will be attacked, they will be beaten, they will be whipped in the churches. And while none of the disciples would face this persecution in Matthew, we know that almost all of the early persecution of the church immediately after Christ's resurrection came from the Jewish community. The Pharisee Paul, or Saul at the time in particular, who would later convert to Christianity, was a chief instigator and opponent of the church. In the first couple of centuries following Jesus' resurrection, Christians often faced accusations from other religious groups. In Rome, they were ironically labeled as atheists, not because they didn't believe in a God, but because they didn't believe in the pantheon of gods. They were accused of being cannibals because they ate Christ's body and they drank his blood every week. They're accused of being incestual because they called each other brother and sister. More recently, we've seen followers of Jesus persecuted as minority populations in different parts of the world. In places like India, where rising Hindu nationalism has led to increased violence across or against followers of Jesus. Or in places like Pakistan and areas of the Middle East where there is Muslim extremists 
who have targeted Christian communities there. There seem to be stories every single week of this there. Disciples of Jesus will find themselves and the gospel message persecuted from other religious groups, according to Jesus. The second source of resistance, though, will come from the government. On my account, Jesus says, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles, which should make us pause for a second. Because in verse 5, and I alluded to this already, was that Jesus said, go to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. In fact, in verse 5, if, you're in your, if you have your Bible in front of you, he actually said, do not go to the Gentiles, do not go to the Samaritans, which at, makes us ask the question, did Jesus forget? Is Matthew confused? What's going on here? How could he say, don't go there, but then, he, but then say, you will be witnesses to that same group of people? Well, what G, what's happening here in Matthew is that Jesus is not just speaking to the people right in front of him, but Matthew, with his, his intention of writing this for the greater church facing, persecu- facing persecution after Christ's resurrection, is, is organizing the story so that way we know that, hey, this isn't just about them. This is about you and me now. This is about the people to come. This is about the church to come. It's not that Jesus forgot, it's that he is both speaking to a group of people in front of him, the 12, the 12 apostles, and for the greater church. Which means that when Jesus says persecution is coming, he's not just talking to the group of people in front of him, he's talking to us. It makes me want to pay attention a little bit more. Jesus himself would be brought before Pilate, the Roman prefect, the governor of Judea. He'd be executed under the authority of Rome. Peter and John, his apostles, would be imprisoned by Roman authorities. Paul would make his way to Rome as a prisoner of Christ. In the early church, followers of Jesus faced various risks of persecution, depending on who was the emperor at the time. We know from Pliny the Younger, who was a governor in what's now Turkey, that one of the great questions of the time period for, was what reason, under what, under what reasons can we, perse- or can we try followers of Jesus? Was it because they did something wrong? Most Christians thought that they were innocent. Or was it simply because they refused to worship Caesar and they claimed the name of this Jesus person? You know what the emperor responded with? Anyone who claims the name of Christ would be executed, but anyone who was willing to denounce the name of Jesus and worship Caesar could be released and forgiven. Today, though we live in a pluralistic society in which our freedom to practice and express our religious beliefs is a protected right, one that I'm very thankful for, Resistance still comes at times, especially when the moral teachings of Jesus go against the authority of the state. It made national news last month when Chris Avell, he was a pastor, he is a pastor in Ohio, was arrested and charged for refusing to obey zoning ordinances because he decided to keep his church open 24-7 as a shelter for people struggling with homelessness during the winter. Ashton Pittman, who's a journalist for the Mississippi Free Press, and from all, I, from what I can tell, is not a follower of Jesus, had this to say, and I find this fascinating. He said, every now and then, we get a rare story about a Christian leader who actually follows the teachings of Jesus, and it often coincides with them being arrested. This is actual persecution of a Christian by the state. I could almost... It's hard for me to read without hearing the, the, uh, the stressing of the word actually here. As if maybe for the most part, the reason we don't see this happen more is because a lot of followers of Jesus don't act very Jesus-like. But when the way of Jesus runs counter to the authority of the state, that's when resistance might arise. And while we might be privileged to live in a country where religious liberty is a protected right, Jesus' admonition to be both blameless and wise is still needed. The motivations that led to the persecution of the church at the hands of Rome are the same motivations at play today. To be a disciple of Jesus is to acknowledge that the ultimate authority is not the local, state, or federal government. The ultimate authority for each of us lies with the creator of the cosmos. And to challenge the government's authority is to invite the potential for persecution to occur. And then, after saying all this, Jesus gets personal. 
He says, brother will betray brother to death. A father, his child, children will rise against parents and have them put to death. I don't care how dysfunctional your family is. It is not that bad yet. Some of you are like, you don't know my mother-in-law. Touche. I personally don't live in fear that my brother will kill me because I choose to follow Jesus. I just don't. However, that's not to reduce what Jesus is saying to just an exaggeration or for another time or place. We cannot overstate the effectiveness and the ability of the family to form and shape how we live our lives. And the truth behind what Jesus is saying here is that for some, as they claim and proclaim the gospel message, they will come under intense pressure from the people they love most. You and I know this inherently, that to resist your family of origin or your tribe can be very challenging and painful. Some of you have had to do it. From a neurological perspective, strong family bonds are rooted in your neural wiring. Our brains are designed to prioritize our close family relationships. When a child is born, the the love hormone oxytocin floods the brains, not just of the child being born, not just the mother giving birth, not just the father there, but even the siblings in the family, reinforcing the connection they feel for each other through things like trust and empathy. When we have positive interactions with our family members, dopamine is released, and this further enforces the desire for us to continue to socialize with and bond and interact with our family. From a historical perspective, strong family bonds have been essential for our survival The ability to cooperate among family members, whether it be gathering resources or protecting each other from threats or raising children, has increased the likelihood of survival for our species, and it has further shaped the neurological basis of family bonding. The clinical psychologist James J. Chris says, breaking away from family patterns can be incredibly challenging because they are not just social constructs, but are rooted in our emotional and biological makeup. Jesus is warning his followers of the challenges that can arise when we pick him over our family or over our tribe. To go against a family is incredibly difficult. To be turned against by your family for your faith is incredibly difficult. And Jesus' encouragement is that we would endure it. Now, before we get to the last source of resistance, we need to acknowledge something that has been going on, a debate that's been happening for many years over this passage. Should you and I expect to experience persecution like what Jesus describes? No and yes. See, it's my opinion that up to this point, what Jesus has been doing is dealing with particulars, that he has been foreseeing sources of resistance that will come against particular people, in particular places at particular times, meaning that you might face persecution, but I don't believe it's a guarantee that you will face religious or governmental or family resistance to the gospel. And this is just my opinion, but based on the text and the lived experience of many faithful followers of Jesus, persecution is not a universal thing And for many, it can lead, or some, it can lead to a sense of guilt that they aren't following Jesus effectively because they're not being persecuted. And maybe for some that could be true, but I think for most of us, it simply is that you and I are so privileged to inhabit a particular moment in history, in this particular country, in this place, where persecution is very uncommon. But remember I said there's four sources of persecution. We've only covered three. And in the final one, Jesus moves from the particular to what I believe is universal. And he universalizes persecution to every single person who faithfully follows him. Let's return to the passage. Let's pick up in verse 22. Jesus says this, All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be Save the, the NRSV translation says it this way, and I find it more helpful. You will be hated by all because of my name. There is a form of persecution that comes for every single person who follows the way of Jesus. 
And it's who, or more appropriately, what Jesus is referring to when he says the word all. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by all? Does he mean every single person will persecute you? Well, we know just through ra- right, being rational creatures, that's not true. Not every single person will persecute us. I think, and many scholars think this as well, that when Jesus says all, he's using a summation for society as a whole what the New Testament authors and the early church called the world. What is the world? And why would the world resist us? Why would the world hate us, as Jesus says? Well, a quick word on each. Well, it's alluded to in the New Testament. It's really the early writings of the, of the early church, especially the desert fathers and mothers, who talk about the world as being one of the three great enemies of our souls, alongside the flesh and the devil. Together, those three, the world, the flesh, and the devil, form a sort of anti-trinity fighting over our souls or fighting for our soul. And many have tried to define what the early followers of Jesus meant when they talked about the world as an enemy of the soul. And the best description I've come across is from the pastor and author, John Mark Comer, who defines the world as this. The system of ideas, values, morals, practices, and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a, cor- in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil. There's a lot there. It's a good definition, and we're going to come back to it in a second. But the second question I ask, why does the world, as we're defining it, resist the gospel? Why does it hate us? Well, Jesus gives us a really good clue in the Gospel of John. There, Jesus writes this in John 15. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first, Jesus. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world because I've chosen you out of the world. And that is why the world hates you. So according to Jesus, the world hates those who belong to him because the world hates him and his message, the gospel. A message that subverts the power structures and values and authorities of the world, that pulls people away from being subjects to and subservient to the world's systems and values. This last form of resistance is very different than the rest. And the persecution that comes from the world is typically more subtle and manipulative than others. And while I like John Mark's definition that we looked at, I want to simplify it a bit in a way that I find more helpful for me. It's, I would say this, the world then, based on, based on what John Mark said, and based on what we read from Jesus, is the cumulative pressure that we live under every day to conform to a way of life that rebels against God's definition of good. And this occurs wherever God's definition of good threatens the authorities and powers of this world. Every single day, each of us is under pressure to conform to the world around us. Every day, our culture attempts to shape us into people who would more readily identify ourselves as capitalists or materialists or or humanists or Democrats or Republicans or even Americans before we would say we are followers of Jesus. That is what the world wants. And as I've said before, and I will continue to say every single day, you and I are formed into something or someone. And the question is not who are you being formed or are you being formed, but who or what are you being formed into? The world wants you to be a person who adopts the societal values and systems of a culture that is in a state of moral decay. And to resist that pressure will cost you The British theologian Theo Hobson in his book, Reinventing Liberal Christianity, sums up how persecution from the world works. He calls it a moral revolution. This is how he describes it. What was universally condemned is now celebrated. What was universally celebrated is now condemned. And those who refuse to celebrate are condemned. What used to be considered sinful, society calls good. What society used to call good They label sin, and anyone who refuses to openly celebrate this change or who attempts to resist it are condemned or shamed or canceled or passed over for promotions or labeled as bigots and so on. Can you see how the world can be a persecuting force 
against followers of Jesus. If this form of persecution is one we will all face, and I believe it is, and we could face some from the other three, is there hope for us? Does Jesus give us something to cling to, some guidance on what we do in the face of this sort of resistance to his message? Yes. Let's go back to verse 26, and we'll end. This is, where, this is how we'll wrap up. Jesus says this, so do not, after everything Jesus has said, these four, persecu- these four sources of persecution that will come against the gospel and his message, do not be afraid of them, those who carry out the persecution. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. He's talking about the gospel message the gospel message will still go out regardless of what comes against it. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So do not be afraid. The third time he said that, you were worth so much more than many sparrows. And then Jesus ends with this, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my father in heaven. Jesus gets to the purpose behind his message in this passage. His point isn't to scare us, to make us become paranoid, to always be looking over our shoulders in fear of what might be to come. What are his followers supposed to do? Continue with the task that he's given us, acknowledging the name of Jesus and proclaiming the gospel. Why? Because we have nothing to be afraid of, according to Jesus. Jesus' answer to the natural fear and concern and paranoia and uncertainty that come and can easily arise in the face of this sort of resistance he predicts is to point us back to our heavenly father and his deep love and concern for each of us. We don't need to fear those who at most can kill the body. Instead, Jesus says, fear the one in whose hands rests your very soul. What does it mean to fear God? Well, Tim Keller once wrote this, to be in fear of the Lord is not to be scared of him. Rather, it's a recognition of his immense power and his holiness. And from that recognition, a personal sense of awe and submission and a desire to obey. Ultimately, to fear God means to have a proper understanding of who he is, which leads us to a place of awe and submission and willingness to be obedient to the task he's put before us. The task of claiming and proclaiming his name. And if that wasn't enough encouragement, I keep coming back to this verse from John. And it's really resonant with me in this Lenten season as we keep casting our minds to the coming Easter and the resurrection. And John, after sharing the news of his impending death and sharing about the persecution that would come for his followers, Jesus says this, all of this I have told you so that way you will, so you will not fall away. So you will endure. And then Jesus tells them about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come that the comforter, the advocate will be with them. And Jesus ends after saying that, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world, you and I will have trouble, but we can be encouraged. For Christ on Easter morning overcame the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that for many of us, the risk of persecution that your followers faced is not a, not a likelihood for us. God, we're aware that around the world, there are others faithfully following you who have much more hardship than we do who literally fear their life 
as they come together on a Sunday morning to worship you. God, I pray that you would, one, remind us of this, the ways that you blessed us, the, the particular place, the particular culture, the particular country you've placed us in. But God, at the same time, that you would encourage a boldness within us to, in the face of whatever resistance might come as we seek to proclaim the gospel message, God, that we would persevere, that we would endure for the sake of your name because you love us and we have nothing to fear. God, thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. Amen. We invite you to please rise as we sing goodness of God. We serve a God who is good and holy. 
No matter what comes, we will sing of his goodness still. Thank you so much for joining us today. If uh, I'd love to invite you to cafe after service. would love to meet you back there. There's some refreshments. And when you go back there, I just want to challenge you. We're a group of introverts for the most part. Say hi to one person who you don't know, okay? Uh, welcome them. And if you, yeah, I don't know, maybe share something interesting about you. Like, what's your greatest fear? Like, mine's spiders. And I guess I conquered that today. Uh, hey, again, thank you for being here. As we go out, um, would you pray the benediction? Uh, if you're watching online, would you pray this over us as we pray this over you? Here we go. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you until we meet again. Amen. Go in peace. Yeah.